Uh, I'm Andrew Carr. I'm from ThoughtWorks. Uh, I work as a user experience designer, and I guess um, let's start off by just giving a little bit of sense of why you should listen to what I say is kind of what I asked my question when I wrote this. So uh, I'm a mobile-obsessed visual designer, um, which means I don't have to tuck my shirt in. Uh, unfortunately, um, and a semi-competent developer, which I think is actually, I'll talk more about why that's a really unique tool within the space where we work. Um, I'm also a recovering Apple fanboy, but still just a technology geek. Um, uh, Horace talked about LG's upswing, and I'm one of the reasons. Um, so um, I'm also the last person to talk before lunch, so it means that I'm in total control of you now for like the next 30 minutes. Um, so. The thing we've been talking a lot about today is mobile is the new normal, full stop. Like that, there's no way that we can start thinking about no mobile as a strategy, right? You just heard the mention of, you know, let's stop talking about uh, mobile strategy and let's just talk about mobile as a channel. The next generation of our users will be born into this sort of post-desktop world. Um, and, and in the developing world, we're talking about people have bypassed desktop computing altogether and have moved straight on to mobile. There's people that will never see a, a, mobile, a mobile computer or a desktop computer anymore. Um, so one of the things we have to deal with today are today's challenges, which is dealing with size and resolution. Um, so things like, you know, constantly the phones are going bigger and, and higher resolution, um, as well as we're getting these new interaction methods like um, uh, Samsung's AirTouch, um, as well as faster networks in the cloud technology they talked about, where content's being delivered, streaming instead of being locally stored. Not to mention what's on its way. So we've got a bevy of things like LED, flexible LED screens, um, and then these relay devices we talked about. And relay devices are anything from like eye watches to things like um, light bulbs and, and, and things like that, as well as new interaction methods where we start swiping our whole arm. And, and just for your counter, yes, Google Glass was in there as well. Um, and then beyond, talking about, like you said, implants and digestibles and integration. So this is a scene from Star Trek where they talk about you know this constant net, you know stitched into the board kind of thing. Um, so how do you design something that's infinitely variable and constantly changing? Well, first off, you don't. Um, and, and at least not with techni techniques that you know today. Um, so there are ways you can kind of try and keep up, though. So from a design perspective, one of the ways you need to start doing it is this thing called continuous design. So for me, I, I'm, I love to work within the teams, right? I, I never really bought into this whole idea of, that I'm there as a designer to create art for developers to make into software. Because it's usable, it's interactive, it's got all these different things about it that you really just can't pre-plan for, you can't figure out ahead of time. You've gotta sort of adapt and react. And it means you can also fine tune your designs to suit your development capability, right? You might get to the point in time where you've built up this feature as in this idea, this massive idea that you wanna do, but you get down to the point where you're, you're coming down to the wire and your scope is already creeped beyond what you thought it would be and your timelines are way off, and you can say, you know what, let's ditch that feature. Let's forget that. Let's, let's, let's not do that. And it means there's no more massive upfront design. There's no more investment into designing something that you may never build. Responsive design. So using things like responsive design techniques through media queries means that you can actually sort of get a, a, as close as possible to a one sort of one thing fits all solutions in, in web versions. Um, but what responsive design can also adapt out as you go into marketplaces like, um, like Android and, and things like that. And as Apple, at some point, it's going to have to release a phone that's wider than it currently is. So this idea of that when you build the sites, you don't build sites that are hinging upon a specific width. You build them to be flexible and weighted and, and adapt to the widths that you're doing. Um, and, it, and again, no more pixel-perfect mock-ups. Instead, of, instead of, of designing these sort of pieces of artwork that then become dynamic websites. You are a designer and a developer working together. So you have designers that know how to code and developers that have an eye for creativity. And those take those, those concepts straight from, you know, sketches on a napkin or sketches on a piece of paper to, to things that are actually working software um, in the browser. Um, I've actually gotten to the point now where I've ditched Photoshop in some cases and just gone straight into HTML and CSS because most of what I would be doing in, in Photoshop can now be replicated using CSS3. It means that I'm prototyping really, really fast and I'm getting results and I'm getting things that's actual working software straight out of my concepting sessions. So stop designing stuff and start building, right? So just, or, or design while you build kind of thing. The other thing that's really interesting, and I think we talked about a little bit, is, is that there's this misconception that user experience is, is this really 
difficult task. And, and I know Jason's here, and there's probably a couple other UX people I really respect. But at the same time, I think user experience is something that anyone can do. Any stakeholder, any BA, any dev developer can be taught how to do user experience research. And, and the more of them that do it, the more interesting you're going to get. It means that you build those prototypes rapidly, you build them quickly, and then you validate them immediately. So talk to your customers as soon and as fast as possible. I've worked in environments before where we even ran a, a Friday user testing session just with people in-house, or we'd bring in external ones if we couldn't find any in-house people who were interested. Just getting that validation immediately. So let's look a little bit further, though. So I think there's this thing, right? We keep talking about Google Glass, and, and every self-respecting geek is talking about it. But I think there's some overarching design decisions that are really apparent in here. So beyond the, the whole augmented reality, beyond the whole um, this is really cool tech, there's some very, very clearly defined direction that's been given with this. And I think this is something that's indicative of where we're going. And, and that's that we're moving towards this sort of post-app space where, where experiences aren't about the interfaces or the interactions. They're actually going to be about that content provided. And so it's kind of back to what the last talk was about, where it's, it's sort of that you're no longer getting an app because it's like this cute, clever experience. That, that really what's the key driver in all of this is, is providing that content um, and, and those experiences around that content. So the best way for me to define that is to go through and start talking about some different ways to provide, I guess, better content and provide content to users in this sort of post-app post space. Right, so situation aware content. Tell, most users now with smartphones have the ability to be targeted and positioned, and I think you just mentioned that as well. Right, so tell me what I want to know, when and where I want to know it. So this is an example of an app that I think is really clever called Field Trip, and this is based on really Google wanted to take its ability to purchase the Zagat, some of the Zagat information and a number of other feeds and bring it in. So the way you build this app, the way you work with this app, is you, you start by setting up things that you have interest in, right? And then from there, you just walk around, which we all do on a day-to-day -day basis, right? You walk around the city. Last night, we came out of the bar. My phone buzzes at me, and I have a card saying, hi, hey, by the way, there's this new hipster place around the corner. Um, and, and so that's a really interesting way to provide these extra experiences to people as they just travel through their everyday lives. And it's almost becoming that kind of passive experiences. The other one that I think is really interesting is, is the example of Square. So Square is a, a point of sale system in the US that's doing some pretty remarkable stuff and is really breaking down this traditional idea of the point of sale system that you have to use as a small business. So they've got an app for the iPhone, which they encourage users to download and kind of use as an e-wallet. And then they've got an app for the point of sale system. And, and basically what you can do is you can walk into a coffee shop and they can, you can pull out your phone and you can order your coffee and never have to stand in line. Right? It bypasses that whole experience that you, you don't want to have. You, you order your coffee, you come up to the counter, and they look at you and they look at your picture and, and boom, you've got your coffee and you've, you've bypassed the whole line. So use that ability to know where your users are to validate that thing and kind of make their experiences quicker and faster. Um, User-aware content. So use the data you have about your users to provide better content to your users. Start employing things like, you know, kind of predictive algorithms. Start tagging and figuring out, you know, your types of users. You know, get that target demographic of, you know, old white guy and get your target demographic of, you know, American hipster. Like figure out who these people are and, and then show them targeted content based on that. Tap into all that data that we all say that we have. Um, so an example of this one that I think is really interesting, and I'm going to get you another buzzword, Julian, which is gamification, right? So these guys started with gamification. Now, it's not necessarily part of their core pitch anymore now because they've used that gamification to gather huge bi uh, bits of information about their users. Um, and that information about their users is, is, can be used for simple things like, okay, so what's happening near where I'm currently standing? Here's a place I've never heard of that's brand new. Here's a place that my friends are all at. And it's that kind of creepy element to it, but at the same time, it's providing that extra information. I arrive at a place and I feel like a local already because I've received the tip from a complete stranger about what they do and don't like. Now, there's something else that's kind of lying underneath that, and I'll have you flip the slides there real quick, which is through Foursquare, they've actually gotten cultural data 
provided to users. So on the left here, we've basically got um, a map of Manhattan Island in New York, and on the right, we've got uh, Tokyo's business district. And so if you look at this, what you can actually see is you see variances in the way humans interact across the city. So in New York, it's this buzzing hive of activity, and people are moving short distances kind of across the major parts of, this, uh, of Manhattan Island, whereas Tokyo is this spider web of kind of people moving in and out of the city. So we're getting deeper information. This is information based on just simply you know, people checking in at, at restaurants and, and locations, but this becomes culturally relevant to things like civil engineering and, and, and transportation. Um, it shows you how that, that city lives and breathes. Cool, thank you. So the other thing too is, is that a lot of times in, in the space we're in, and I guess I'm coming from living in Australia now for two years, there's a lot of apps in Australia that are simply just created. They are apps that are created to just be in the marketplace. And I think this is one of the reasons I put this one in here is, is that I think there's a lot of apps that have content, that they're there, but they're just replacements for, for analogs that exist in, in desktop or even in branches and things like that. So create apps that t make you do things. So this is Mailbox, for example, from, from, uh, um, from the US, which is basically, you get emails, right? Emails is everybody's you know, enemy. You go on holiday, you come back, and you're like, I've got 2,000 emails. How am I ever going to get rid of 2,000 emails? And so the idea of this one is, is that when you, when you go through that inbox, you take that process that you're kind of cleansing, instead of just having to say, like, oh, I'm going to read this, 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 and just kind of skip it over, and you constantly get this sort of massive amount of unread emails that you know you need to read, this gives you this ability to sort of tag and prioritize your emails and, and, and request action for later. On the other sense, there's apps like this as well that pop up and say, by the way, you, you know, you, you've got these emails that you said you wanted to do these tasks around. Why, why don't you do that now? Why don't you do that at five? And you can snooze it and treat it kind of like an alarm or a calendaring system. The other thing that's interesting, and this is, this is something that's kind of happened in the last two months, is, is allow for casual inter interaction. So shift your thinking from allowing users to move between apps to moving without moving between apps. So, sorry. Um, and, and that's coming come from sort of the Facebook home interaction. And if, I, if I've got any sense of, of Apple trying to compete in this space, I, I guarantee you we're going to see something similar to this coming very, very soon from Apple with the way that they revamp their notifications. The, this idea of that I'm working on one thing and these notifications are going to constantly be coming in because I'm constantly connected, but allow me to quickly shift from one to the other and then right back to the task I was doing. Don't necessarily demand my whole attention with a whole interface. Come up with small interfaces and small interactions that allow me to sort of see what I'm doing and see what you want me to see really quickly and really easily and then move back to what I was doing. Um, and then again, I think the one, I didn't realize that this was right after the, the previous talk, but deli del allow for multi-device experiences and allow for systems that, that allow for that start and stop nature of life. Um, one great example of this is, and I, I, I'm really impressed by this one coming from Australia, which is, is the Qantas example, right? Is, is that this idea of the whole mobile check-in. Over the last six months in, 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 American, or in Australian airports, I've not had to talk to a desk attendant. Which is amazing because it's the worst part of going to the airport. You are, I don't want to sound like Jerry Seinfeld real quick. Like, what's well, the deal with airport check-ins? <laughs> but this is like this is the thing is is that they address this issue that someone thought was unsolvable, right? And 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 I I, I went and right before they rolled this out, I was all across the U.S. I was in 12 U.S. cities over the course of, of a month, and I never once saw an experience as seamless as any of the airports. Even Brisbane Airport has a better check-in experience than any of the major airports in the US and any of the major airlines in the US. Because it's that beautiful bit of the, I, I'm in the cab on the way to the airport, or I'm on the train on the way to the airport, I check in with my phone, I walk up to the terminal, I scan my phone, I get my baggage tag, I put my tag on, I set my bag down, and I'm on my way. Only thing between me and the flight security, but we'll not get into that. So that whole idea is, 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 a, is a really brilliant way to sort of make these experiences happening. And, and, I, and I, answer, I asked this question because actually Julian, this is a quote from Julian, not you, um, but these are all startups and innovators. Why can't, my company can't act this way. I don't, I don't think that anyone should be thinking that way. If you're here in this room, you're already not thinking that way, which is a good sign. But I think I wanted to bring it down to an example of how, how can you apply this to just a basic, basic model. It doesn't have to be, you know, I've got, Foursquare, or I'm Facebook, or, or I'm you know, some innovative startup that's going to launch a, a new email app. So everybody's got locations or branches or stores. 
Um, and in those places, you have that inevitable example of you're going to be waiting in a line. Why can't you use the information about your users? Because what do you do when you're in a line, right? You, you know, I'm up, you know, I'm waiting in line of what's going on in Instagram. What's Julian doing Instagram? Oh, Gareth's got the hashtag. He's doing TW Live. So um, it's that idea. What, what, and there's this convenient chance that one of your users is going to open your app, right? I'm standing at line at the, in line at the bank. I'm standing in line um, at a retail store, and I open up to just, you know, okay, we'll see if they got anything, deals going on, specials, things like that. Why not use that information? They open your app, they pop in a message, and the message says, hey, you know, why don't you go to the counter with this special code, and you'll skip the line, or why don't you have this discount on this product, or why don't you do these things? Why don't we assist the user in knowing where they are, when they are, and what they're doing? Um, so I guess the questions you want to ask when you go into these situations when you're dealing with mobile is, first, we, we treat mobile right now like this sort of replacement for desktop in the sense of, oh, well, we'll just rebuild this system. We'll just rebuild this web form. But do you have those systems that support this way of thinking? I think that's what Stu and Johnny talked about earlier, is, is that how do you build those back-end systems that allow you to take advantage of all this unique information that mobile can bring to you? And then that cost, what is the cost of not addressing mobile in a unique way? Right? Users are going to expect now that you have mobile capabilities and you have rich mobile capabilities. And then also, are you tapping into those unique insights that mobile offers? And then, yeah, how can, how can mobile, as, an, as a unique platform, deliver better experiences to customers? I think that's, that's it. Thank you. Any questions? Mark here with the microphone, some questions on design, development, working together. Hipster life. Hipster life. <laughs> you know what's for lunch? Well, I have a question. I mean, we have a lot of customers out here that are starting to look more at, um, if not outsourcing, then certainly geographically separate teams. Mm -hmm. um, how do these concepts work? It, you know, you're kind of alluding to a lot of working closely together, but what if that's not an option? How do you? Um, I, actually, at the moment, I'm working in a situation that's sort of closely together but far apart. So using technologies like Google Hangouts and Skype and, and things like that, I actually am l a designer living in Melbourne, working with a team that's both in Sydney and Brisbane. So that, that ability to actually use video chat and become casual across video chat and screen sharing, I, I don't think has actually inhibited me. So if, if you can actually set yourself up in a way that you have advantages like tech, you know, like video, sh video chats and, and screen sharing and stuff like that. You can actually do distributed teams just as well as you do a per in person team. Like I obviously once every couple of weeks go and visit the team, but there's a lot of what we what I would normally do is being done remotely. I don't think there's any. I don't. I don't, I don't know. I've got a couple of guys from my team here. I don't think we've had any too too many of challenges. Well, you break the build every day. Um, any other questions? I guess the other thing I, I guess I didn't talk on, I'll, I'll answer my own question yeah. then, Julian. <laughs> um, I guess the other thing I didn't talk about as well is, is that um, from a perspective of, of upfront design, how many of you guys in your businesses currently rely on marketing agencies to create visual content for your, for your products? Quite a few. So I, I think that's the other thing that, that I, a lot of the mentality for, for me has changed is that it's something where we're no longer creating just marketing presentations of apps. Like apps are no longer just marketing presentations. So I think one of the things that continuous design allows for is this idea of creating that rich experience around the app and not just creating something that's just a visual presentation of, of a service offering or a product. Um, it's allowing for that deeper interaction that you're looking for.